This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 386, recorded on April 22nd, 2016. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Howdy, Vincent. How are you? Well, are you actually in Florida? I am actually in Florida. Uh, I am sitting in my uh, office at home. uh, And it is 82 degrees Fahrenheit and a few clouds. Beautiful day. It finally got warm here this week. It warmed up. It's in the high 60s every day. It's been crazy, right? Up and down. Yeah, it's been up and down, but now everything is blooming. It's 26C right now, although it's very cloudy. It's supposed to rain later. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. It seems so long that everyone's been on that I almost forget where you're from, (laughs) but not really. Ann Arbor. In Harbor, Michigan. You've been on two weeks ago, right? I think you were on. That's correct. It just seems like a long time when you skip an episode. Right. How's the weather out there? 83% humidity. Mm. And it's uh, 60 degrees, which is 15.5 Celsius. Kathy, are you the same department as Alice and Akira? Yeah, 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 right down the hall from Alice and right upstairs from Akira. They've been say say hello for me. I will do that. They have been on TWIV. Mm -hmm. In case you're wondering who that voice belongs to, (laughs) because if you're a TWIV listener, you know it's not Alan Dove, it's not Dixon de Pommier. They're not here today, actually, but it is someone who has been on TWIV before a long time ago, episode 122, and the name of that was "More Than a Monkey Full of Viruses." And he is from the biology department at Boston College. I'm giving you a lot of time to think about who this might be. Uh, and, you know, if you thought who it was, let us know. Of course, it's Welkin Johnson. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's good to be here. I think probably the last time I was on TWIV, you were you were broadcasting with a ham radio out of your parents' garage. So. <laughs> it's changed a bit, yes. <laughs> There's been a lot of episodes since then. It is yeah. a lot. We're approaching 400 yeah, that's a pretty good milestone, and I suspect we'll reach 500 um, and keep going. When you do it every week, they add up. Yeah. So you've been well? Yeah, yeah. Boston um, College. You know, my, my uh, offspring college visits did not bring us to uh, any school in Boston. That's unfortunate. Yeah, because I'm sure you get lots of colleagues who visit because of that, but not happening, and we're not going there. Now, we also have a, a guest who uh, was a student uh, in your lab and now is a postdoc with another friend of TWIV. Uh, he is a postdoc in the Lubin Lab at the University of Massachusetts in Worcester. Ted Deal, welcome, Ted. Hello, hello. Hey, that's what Jeremy would have said. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he's rubbing off on me. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Listen. Um, uh, Ted, Ted was actually a student with Eric Hunter. Sorry. Correct. Who, he was what a, was he doing in your lab? He was postdoc. Uh, a postdoc on a way to a postdoc. Right. You know, I made some assumptions there, but that's okay. You're here to correct us. So you were a postdoc, and you're a postdoc in Lubin's lab. And I was going to say, Ted, you should have asked us before you went to Jeremy's lab. We would have told you not to go there, to avoid it, like the plague. <laughs> just, just kidding. We like Jeremy very much. I think the plague is about the only thing that Jeremy's not working on. He's working on a lot of things, huh? Yeah. Is he working on Zika? A little bit. Yeah, everything, everything. That's Jeremy. Well, that's good. You'll have a good time there in Worcester. Uh, this uh, is Happy Earth Day. Well, it's it's Earth Day, and I'm wishing you a Happy Earth Day. So those of you who celebrate it, the Google Doodle is all there for you to look at. And this episode is sponsored by ASM. They want you to know about their Agar Art Contest. And here what you do is you take a Petri dish and you streak it with your favorite microbe in an artistic fashion, and let it grow up. Take a picture of it and send that into ASM. The deadline is coming up Friday, May 6th. The winners and select runners-up will be showcased in a gallery at ASM Microbe. That's the meeting in Boston this June. 
And winners also get a free book from ASM. And if you want to know how to do this and so forth, all the guidelines go to bit.ly slash augerart2016. And I was a judge last year. I shall be this year. And I understand that someone in your lab, Welkin, is also a judge. Uh, yeah, Jamie Hensey. I think it's probably the second time she's done it. Yeah, she was on the conference call last year. That's right. Yeah. I met this week in New York uh, one of the winners from last year. I was at a little meeting and I sat at the lunch table, and this woman waved to me, and he, she said, I, I won. I said, what did you win? She said, I won the Agar Art Contest. Oh, I was like, come over here, tell me about it. It's Christine Marizzi. She is, this is a very cool job to have, actually. She works for the DNA Learning Center at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Oh, neat. And she works here in New York City. She goes to schools and um, teaches them how to do things. And we're going to have her on the show sometime because she can tell us all about it. It seems like a cool job, cool career. Anyway, we thank ASM for their support of TWIV. And we have an email from Alan Dove who writes, Hey, folks, I doubt I'll have Wi-Fi at TWIV o'clock. So here's my update. 23C, 82% humidity, partly sunny here in Puerto Ayora, Santa Cruz, Galapagos. I've attached a portrait of a local. <laughs> He's got this big. Anybody know what kind of lizard that is? That's an iguana. It's an iguana? Wow. Uh, you, I, 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 my assumption is it's an iguana. The Galapagos is lousy with iguanas, and it looks like an iguana. He should have put a banana for scale. <laughs> <laughs> if those are maybe six-inch boards, it's pretty yeah. big, actually. Yeah, I bet they're six or 12-inch boards, right? They could be. Or eight-inch. Yeah, it's hard to know, isn't it, Welkin? Well, anyway, Alan, have fun in the Galapagos. We will miss you. We have plenty to talk about here today. We have a paper, and this is why you guys are here. Uh, we have a paper. You, you And I have to say, I've been roundly criticized in the last few weeks for using guys to refer to everyone. And just like I'm trying to purge so from my lexicon, I'm trying to purge guys. So... Uh, who's Who's doing the round criticism? Yeah. What what are you going to replace it with, Paul? <laughs> yes, yeah, well, someone. So first of all, I want to know if it's if it's Brits or if it's Southerners or if it's women. Okay, here's here's the story, Kathy. And actually, I've used you in defense, but it wasn't bought. So over on Twim, uh, Michael Schmidt said, uh, "You guys," and and Michelle Swanson immediately said, "Hey, guys and gals," and I said, "But Kathy uses." guys for everyone she yeah. said it was okay so then we got a letter from someone who said it's not gender neutral it's gender absorptive and i don't like it and then kathy the other day <laughs> we got an email from pat schloss who okay said, who said it was really bad to do this so i i'm i have enough of guilt complexes in my life but i really feel bad now so i have to purge the guys Whew, that was a long story <laughs> Except wow that's case. weird because michelle and i grew up only about 30 <clears throat> miles apart and I grew up just fine with the term guides for everybody. And I, I think of it as gender neutral. I gender neutral. I'd never even heard the term gender absorptive. <laughs> Kathy, I told Michelle you were my barometer for appropriateness. <laughs> if you're okay with it, I yeah. am. But um, yeah. so well, anyway, what was I saying? Well, because the Brits <laughs> often um, uh, object to it too because guy is a much more derogatory term because uh, of guy fox yeah well anyway um <laughs> ted and welkin have published a paper and we're uh, both guys by the way so, yeah <laughs> but i just want to purge it from my brain because otherwise i will use it inappropriately um actually so i heard a podcast today uh in the car and someone used guy and he said i can't purge my brain of all the inappropriate stuff i learned when i was young not inappropriate, but then everyone used these terms. It's hard to get rid of it. But I, I have been pretty good at getting rid of so. Good. Uh, so uh, maybe we can get rid of guy. <laughs> <sighs> Welkin and, and Ted have published a paper in uh, eLife, and that's what we're here to talk about. And it is called Tracking Interspecies Transmission and Long-Term Evolution of an Ancient Retrovirus Using the Genomes of Modern Mammals. Succinct title. Did you make it up, Ted? Uh, I don't know. I think it was Welkin and I collaborating on that one. 
Yeah, I think we texted back and forth for quite a while. So you were gone, Ted, by the time uh, you were writing this up? Is that right? Yeah, there was a draft before I left, but it got no. finalized after I was gone. Where are you from, Ted? Uh, upstate New York originally. Really? Syracuse? Uh, a little north of there. Tiny little town called Mexico. No. Yes way. <laughs> and it's just south of Texas, New York. <laughs> Good thing. Otherwise, we'd be yeah. confused. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Never lots. be able to locate it. Wow. And where did you, you, you grew up there, you went to high school and all that up there? Is that yep, right? yep. And college? College, I started off at St. Lawrence University mm -hmm. for uh, freshman year. Then I transferred down to Tulane. Um, got my bachelor's, my master's at Tulane. And um, then I went to Eric Hunter's lab at Emory nice. for my PhD work. Were you uh, a science major in college? Uh, I was a dual major. Mm -hmm. um, I did uh, biology and history. Do you have any science in your family? Uh, my mother, um, she got, again, a dual degree and worked at MGH for a little while as a technician in a bacteriology lab. Mm. So then, um, I think uh, Welkin said earlier, your postdoc, you did a postdoc with Eric as well? I did a brief postdoc. So I finished up there and okay. then did, you know, the nine months or so and okay. moved okay. up with Welkin. So your real postdoc, was, first postdoc was with Welkin then, right? Right, right. And this is the, you, go ahead, Welkin. You should know that Ted was also an ambulance driver somewhere in there. <laughs> really? And I Ted was. could tell stories you don't want to hear at the dinner table. <laughs> That's true. Better than being an ambulance chaser. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although being an ambulance chaser generally gives you more money. Yeah, it does. <laughs> That's for sure. I got an email from an EMT this morning, which will appear on TWIV in a long time. And she <laughs> said she loves listening to TWIV. So that's cool. You got all kinds of listeners. Um, so uh, how long were you in, in Welkin's lab, roughly? Uh, three years, I think. Okay. And now you've gone to... Uh, Jeremy's lab. Now, uh -huh. now, now, this paper of that we're going to talk about today um, seems to me, if I remember, it is computational biology for the most part. Is that right? Uh, sure, we'll call it computational biology. What do you like to call it? Because that's what uh, Eugene Kuz, uh Coonan. Coonan, thank you. I am just out of it today. That's what he told us to call it instead of um, bioinformatics. Bio he doesn't like that term. What do you like? I don't know. I feel um, bad calling it computational biology because I can't actually do any coding. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's good. So it, it's hard for me to, to get over it. that and it. call it computational. We, we have a theme on today's show, things you shouldn't call things anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But at the, at the, looking at it, this is entirely computers, That's right? right? This is all sequences that I gleaned from the databases. It right. shows that you don't have to code to be a computational biologist, right? Right. Well, yeah. I really, I really appreciate this because uh, the it's a different kind of thinking. The imagination, for me, the imagination that goes into mining the data that are out there in this fashion is yeah. uh, is new to me. It's it's very interesting, very imaginative. I really like it. The, re the reason I, I just mention that is because I, I wanted to know if in Welkin's lab you ever did any wet experiments. Oh, sure. Yeah. You yeah. have? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yep. Because you can imagine that the, you might not have, right? And, but in Jeremy's lab, you're certainly doing wet experiments, right? Yes. Uh, almost exclusively. All right. Yeah. Ted, Ted left us with a bunch of spinoffs of this that'll probably be mostly experimental. Nice. All right, so let's start by talk. This is all about endogenous retroviruses, and uh, you, you guys, you and Welkin, <laughs> would like to tell us about how that works. So maybe I guess Ted, you would like to tell us how how an endogenous retrovirus gets in a an animal and what happens when it stays there. Sure. So, um, in order for a retrovirus to get into the the genome, it has to access the germline. Um, whether that's through infection of one of the spermatocytes, an egg, a sperm, or um, a developing embryo at an early stage. 
Um, infection has to occur in some lineage that will then develop into uh, the next ge generation's spermatocytes or oocytes um, to pass on the, the proviral DNA. Um, so all of these retroviruses, you know, being that they are retroviruses, uh, reverse transcribe their RNA genome um, and then integrate that DNA, the newly synthesized DNA, into the host chromatin. Um, and then after it's integrated, it gets passed down in a Mendelian fashion um, from mother to daughter and so on and so forth. Um, all of the viruses that we're looking at in this paper, um, this endogenous endogenization event occurred millions and millions of years ago and we're just looking at the, um, the DNA that exists in the genome now. Um, so there's, after the initial endogenization event, there's a number of selective forces that are shaping what we're seeing um, in the genome sequences that we have available. Um, if any of these um, loci insert next to a, a gene, an oncogene or something like that, um, it's going to be very deleterious for the, the new progeny. Um, so it'll be highly selected against. Um, so those will probably be lost. And what we're left with is a, a history um, writ mainly in loci that fall outside of uh, coding sequences and probably don't have much enough much of an effect on um, any individual because anything that, that would have an effect would be selected against over the generations. Um, and that also goes for coding potential of the, the sequences. Um, most of the, uh, the gag, pol, or omv coding genes are disrupted fairly quickly um, so that they don't create functional um, proteins. So what, what we actually see in the, the genomes that we've analyzed is fragments and bits and pieces or completely intact but degraded sequences to one extent or another. Some are more intact, some are mm -hmm. far less intact. Can I ask you, does every animal on the planet have an endogenous retrovirus? I would argue yes, mm -hmm. but it depends highly upon what one considers a retrovirus. Um, so th you can consider uh, retro elements that contain two LTRs but no envelope gene mm. a retrovirus, which I would. And in that case, pretty much every, every animal, I would think, any animal that we've sequenced yeah. certainly has those elements at least in it. So you say that after endogenization, the coding capacity or the coding sequences are fairly rapidly disrupted. Right. Um, so yeah. I would assume that, uh, I kind of assume that uh, the virus, it stays active for some period of time. And then this disruption of the coding sequence effectively dis uh, dis uh, I'm sorry, deactivates the virus. So now you have just the sequences left. Uh, when you say relatively rapidly, how, <laughs> these, these how are all fast evolutionary is terms. So, yeah, right. Right. So it's it's not going to be one generation or two, but certainly over a million years. Um, okay. So you could have you could have activity for a, a very significant number of generations before this thing finally dies. Sure, sure. And we see that in laboratory mice um, okay. where you can get reactivation of internal proviruses and those have been there for numerous generations. Okay. Now, the, um, I have a couple of kind of general questions. In humans, we have like 8% of our DNA is a retro element, we call it. And my understanding is some of those are endogenous retroviruses, but... Others are uh, retro elements that were there before retroviruses came on the scene. Is that a fair statement? Uh, I believe that 8% mm -hmm. is entirely composed of sequences derived from 
your retroviruses. Oh, so then the other yeah. um, retro the, elements are other parts of the genome, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So That's, lines and signs would be a much larger portion of the, the okay. genome. Okay. But the vast majority of the endogenous retroviral sequence itself in the human genome is comprised of solitary long terminal repeats, LTRs. Mm. Um, and those uh, get generated once a provirus um, has homologous recombination occur between the yeah. the five prime and the three prime LTR. So you're left with um, just one LTR and an episome that gets lost. Mm-hmm. So that's hey, Vince, Vince. go ahead. That, that's oh, I think seven percent of the genome. The rest is um, got, it. got it. Some other coding potential. Go ahead, welcome. I have a uh, so there's a guy Mike Tristam mm-hmm. is kind of a kind of one of the leaders in this field, although he's famously reclusive. And I I finally met him <laughs> in France about a year ago. I mean I really like his work, and he did this back of the envelope calculation for us. Uh, there's estimated to be about sixty two thousand species of vertebrates, and if we assume that they have about ten thousand endogenous retroviral loci per genome then the database we have to work with ultimately could be on the order of 620 million loci, <laughs> right? Mammals alone would be about 62 million. Um, and that doesn't include the solo LTRs that Ted's talking about. That's, those tend to be about tenfold more common, right? right? So we're talking about billions of, ba- of uh, loci potentially to work with Amazing. for studies like this. And Jonas Blomberg, who's uh, an herbologist, I guess, in Sweden, keeps warning us that we're... There's a massive bioinformatic curtain descending upon us. <laughs> That's a good title, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, a massive bioinformatic curtain. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, w- do we have any sense of what was the earliest endogenization? Like, in, in turn, is it 150 million, 200, or more? It's probably a lot more. The, the, the problem is that, like Ted was explaining, how the sequences degrade. Uh, when you get beyond 150 million years, um, it's hard to recognize yeah, right, the sequences right. anymore. So, but yeah. if you look at the family of retroviruses and you align protein sequences, for example, you can tell that the capsid proteins are related because structurally they're very similar, but mm-hmm. the sequences will have very little identity. Got it. So, so retroviruses could be, you know, a billion years old. We don't really know. Now, you got, uh, Ted, you mentioned that the genomes eventually get littered with mutations, um, yep. but there's still bits there. Why, why are there pieces left? Why doesn't the whole thing go away? Now, we had, well, we had... Uh, Nels Eldy on a couple of weeks ago, and they had their nice paper showing that at least some of the promoters for uh, interferon genes, uh, induced genes, are, are derived from these uh, LTRs. But what about all the other ones? Is there a reason? Is it just hard to kick out DNA, or is there a reason it's there? It's unclear. Mm-hmm. Um, we certainly know certain instances where the coding potential has been um, what's termed exapted. Um, by the host genome. Right. Um, for instance, uh, Terry Heidman's done over a number of years really good work um, characterizing syncytins, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. which form the placenta in mammals. Um, and those, it's certainly a number of different endogenization events have given rise to these syncytins. Um, and they seem to have converged on the same thing with just different viruses in different lineages providing the, the fusogenicity. Mm. Um, certainly in other cases, um, FV1 famously and uh, the murine lineage um, seems to encode a molecule that's able to inhibit um, MLV in infection and probably other viral infections as well um, in mice. So there's certainly uh, a small percentage of them that are providing a function for the for the host, um, but I would say the vast majority of them are just sort of random chance they they manage to to survive, okay. and we know that um, over time the sequences diverge, and this will be 
like the LTRs and everything diverge. And as they diverge, it's harder and harder for the, the two LTRs to recombine, forming a solo LTR element. Mm. Um, so if, if it's able to degrade a little bit rather quickly, it's more likely that those sequences will be retained in the genome. Right, because the LTR recombination spits out the uh, rest of the genome in between. Exactly. Mm. It's probably worth mentioning at this point that endogenization is, is something that it's hard to see, but right now it's happening in koalas, right? It is, yep. And we can watch the endogenous retrovirus spread through the whole population until eventually, I guess, all the koalas in the world uh, have an endogenous retrovirus, which I think they think is, has been acquired from a rodent species, right? It's certainly possible, yeah. yeah. Which, is, which fits with what you conclude from your paper, that these things can, can cross species often, right? Uh, I w don't know. As I would say often because we're period. our paper is certainly looking at a large evolutionary time period. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they they certainly can cross species. So what would I just yeah go ahead. throw in a point about the koalas? It's important to what the koalas have is an exogenous spreading virus mm -hmm. that occasionally winds up in the germline and is so repeated endogenization events are happening. And I forget who did the work, but when they've sequenced those loci from different koalas, they often have different ones. So we're looking, yeah, at, yeah. we're looking at a point right now where the insertions are occurring, but none of them have become fixed in the population. And right. it actually looks, I think at least one paper where they've looked at museum skins, it looks like the, the exogenous virus has been spreading in them maybe 100 years or more. Mm-hmm. That's right. So it, it can take a long time for the process to happen. But eventually, it will start to be passed on to new koalas through the germline, right? And they'll amplify, and maybe it'll be purified. You know, maybe the, the bad insertions will go away or whatever. And uh, You know, if, if Welkin Johnson and Ted Deal of, a, of 500 years from now or 1,000 years from now, look, they might find just a few insertion points. Yes. Because yeah. you're not going to be around, that's for sure. <laughs> I plan to be. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. To, to actually, go ahead. Oh, no, no. sorry. I, you know, the other thing that would be interesting to look at in something like the koalas, Ted mentioned acceptation. Mm -hmm. The other thing that there's some evidence for is sometimes the endogenous viral sequences uh, get co opted as dominant inhibitors of exogenous virus. Mm -hmm. Right. And right. I think Ted might talk about this in a few minutes. So, it would be interesting to see if in the koalas there's any selection. If some of these insertions are actually being uh, positively selected to the benefit of the host, making them resistant to the virus. Right. So, Ted, how did the uh, idea for this paper arise? Was something you and Welkin came up with? <laughs> so, it's actually kind of a funny story. It started off, um, I joined Welkin's lab before he had a lab at Boston College. Um, and in that time period, before the the lab was up and running, uh, he decided to take on a couple of rotation students. And um, we didn't really have much of a, a lab going, so we couldn't give them wet bench work to do. So we hit on this more bioinformatics-y type project. Um, and it all stems really from, mainly from an old paper from the, the Heidman lab um, from 2003, where they looked at IRV FC elements in humans and non non human primates, um, and they they found that in all of the primates that they looked at, um, IRV FC was present, and they speculated that you know it was an ancient endogenization event, and and that um, it was passed between. Um, Either it was passed between uh, the different species or it got passed on vertically. Um, but they didn't really make much of what those, whether it could be one versus the other. Um, and when we looked at the sequences, um, it looked rather more like there was numerous independent lineages in the, uh, the primate species. But we could look at it in much more depth because we actually had the human genome, the chimpanzee genome, the rhesus genome, etc. So we didn't have to do any any bench work that they did and we could 
you know, quickly or relatively quickly in a eight week period or so, um, derive some sort of useful information to, to parse out what was going on and, and the non-human primates. So, so let, let me see if I can, uh, conceptualize this. If you find an endogenous retrovirus, uh, of a, of a certain family in both say humans and non-human primates, there's, uh, two possibilities, right? It could be that this retrovirus was running around infecting both species right. or that the endogenization happened before those two uh, in some common ancestor. Right. 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 And you can, and, or both, right? Could be both. Exactly. But right. there's... Actually, the, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Welkin. <laughs> the, the third possibility is, is that the virus and the hosts we're evolving together and co-speciating, right? Like herpes viruses sure, are like sure. that. They right. sort of stay associated with a particular species and don't jump back and forth much. Or foamy viruses, yes. Yeah. And so the idea is by doing appropriate phylogenetics, you can distinguish amongst these ideas, right? It, it's not just phylogenetics, but yes, phylogenetics is one of the, the techniques that we use. Um, the other way to look at it is that the um, sequences, if they were... Um, passed on vertically, if the endogenous retroviruses were passed on vertically within the species, um, the sequences should diverge in proportion to the time of the last common ancestor of those species. So you can actually use a molecular clock to figure out if that's an appropriate time or not. And that's going to be grossly different if there was exogenous replication going on in that intervening time. Right, so I've been I've been thinking about this. There's basically, uh, let me try and articulate this: two uh, fundamentally two different rates of sequence um, evolution that you can imagine. One, if you have virus replication going on, that in a relative sense is going to uh, diverge pretty fast. Do retroviruses do they? Is there sort of sequence evolution? Kind of like an RNA virus, pretty rapid. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Like HIV, uh, right? Uh, and yet, if you have an inactivated endogenous retrovirus, that's going to drift like a genome sequence, which is much, much, much slower. Correct. Okay. Um, also, there's a couple other things. Um, one of the most diagnostic that you can use is looking for uh, shared orthologous loci in two genomes. So if an insertion occurs in the same spot in two species, it is, I don't know what the numbers are, but it's highly likely that that, that occurred once in right. that and then was passed on to both species right. during the speciation event. So, walk us, you, you decided to focus on a particular uh, endogenous retrovirus. So why don't you walk us through uh, this paper and we'll interrupt you frequently. Sure, sure. <laughs> I'm going to interrupt um, right from the start because he promised to uh, tell us a little bit about why this IRV FC group. And I, I have a question. So this is one group of these, and I want to know how many such groups there are, if you have an estimate for that. Is it five groups? Is it 500 groups? And, and how do you define a group? Uh, mainly phylogenetically is how they're defined. Um, I don't think I can answer with any certainty how many groups there are, but there's certainly more than five. Uh, probably like in, in the low hundreds, depending on if you're a lumper or a splitter, and I <laughs> tend to be a splitter. The human genome has maybe two dozen or more distinct groups, and they can range in copy number from a single copy to tens of thousands of copies. And that's just humans, but it's probably similar in a lot of other species, too. Okay, well, back to part of Rich's question, though. Um, you know, what defines something? You know, I, you mentioned that these FCs are because they have the uh, tRNA complementarity to the primer binding site. Right. Uh, so how long is that complementarity and how identical do they have to be with, within a group to be an IRV FC? Or, yeah. Well, all of the IRV FCs that we looked at, and there's a supplemental figure in the, the paper, um, have 
uh, the tRNA complementarity, and that's about 16 to 19 nucleotides. Okay. Um, and it's and perfect complementarity. It's not perfect, but it's darn close. There's maybe one or two mutations away from that. Okay. But then again, it could be that the, the tRNAs in those species also differ as well. Mm. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's, it's defined based, well, the name comes from the tRNA primer binding site, but the families are defined more generally based on molecular characteris characteristics of the, the greater family. So um, this family, when it integrates, it makes uh, five nucleotide target site duplication. Um, so the integrase cuts five nucleotides away, it makes single cuts five nucleotides away from each other, and then it integrates into that, into that place. Um, normal gamma retroviruses, of which this is one subset of them, um, typically make four nucleotide insertions or target site duplications. Um, it has a um, very skewed uh, C-rich region or C-rich coding sequence. Um, it's also got uh, two zinc fingers in the nucleocapsid, which normally gamma retroviruses have one. So there, there's a number of molecular characteris characteristics that you can use to define um, these types of viruses. Once you so when when you mine a database to find these, do you just use some sort of a uh, blast protocol with a prototypical FC IRV and see what comes out, or is it more complicated than that? So that's exactly what I did. Um, I used either the GAG sequence, well, the capsid sequence, or the RT sequence. And those are, the capsid is the main structural protein. The RT is um, the reverse transcriptase enzyme, both of which are highly conserved between all retroviruses. So when you blast a, a genome sequence with either of these, you're likely to pull out sequences. And then it's upon me to figure out whether or not that's an IRVFC-like sequence. Um, so, so you look for some of these other characteristics? Yeah, so, well, actually, I just threw it on a phylogeny and, and mm. looked to see if it branched with IRVFC or not. Okay. Um, so that was actually round one of my database mining. Round two was to take those sequences that I got from round one and re-blast it against the genome to find more of them. Uh, okay. Um, and these are all, the FC family, these are all simple retroviruses, right? So we're talking about just essentially three genes. GAG, the capsid, RT, the transcriptase, and on the surface protein envelope, right? right? No accessory proteins like HIV and stuff. That we know of, no accessory proteins. There okay. may be um, glycogag, which is part of um, MLV and other um, gamma retrovirus um, sequences. It's an upstream um, initiated uh, translation product that goes through GAG. But we didn't find any evidence that that was conserved, so it's un unclear if we can say that it's there or not. And what, what was your thinking going into this? I mean, what what did you have a question? <laughs> I, no, I just no, we finished. I just finished listening to uh, <laughs> uh, Vincent's last twib, twist mm -hmm. with Stuart Firestein. Okay, <laughs> so so it's okay not to have a question. <laughs> No, we didn't really have a question per se. We had a um, lingering feeling that there was more underlying the previous papers that uh, talked that's right. about IRV FC. That's can right. I can I take a stab at this, Ted? <laughs> sure. He's being nice. So when we when when the lab <laughs> opened at Boston College, uh, everybody else hadn't moved here yet. So I would come over during the day, and Ted would be sitting here bored out of his skull in one of two empty offices and the previous occupants of the lab had left behind a half bottle of scotch wow. and, <laughs> and a paper came out in PLOS One by Barrio and colleagues and they, at least this is my memory of it is we were bored and so we were reading this paper 
which was uh, very bioinformatic. Um, and it had really, if Ted can correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I remember it is there's sort of a paragraph where they, well, what they'd done in the whole paper is they had analyzed the entire IRV content of the dog genome, right, the first carnivore genome to come out. And they had one mention in there that they had seen, among other things, IRV FC like sequences, and that in fact the sequences in the dog genome were similar to the sequences in primates. So maybe in the past a virus had jumped back and forth between a carnivore and a primate. But like a lot of bioinformatic papers, what was frustrating to us, it's what Ted called the 30,000 foot view, mm -hmm. right? It's like mm -hmm. the sentence was intriguing, but there was nothing in the paper where you could drill down and look deeper at that. And, and at least in my memory, that's kind of what kicked off the it was a so little I can, frustration. Yeah, I can see how that and an empty office and a half a bottle of scotch <laughs> would be motivating, right? You'd say, well, you know, how deep does this go? How broad does this go? And just keep going. Yeah, right. it, was, it was a really big rabbit hole, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yeah, it's huge. Did the scotch play some role? The, the scotch did indeed play some role, although, as I re recall, it was more like a nine-tenths full bottle yeah. of scotch when we got there. Uh -huh. Was it good? Was it good scotch? No, it was not good scotch. Yeah, if that's figure, they would leave behind nothing good, right? So, what did you find when you started to drill down? So, what we did was search through all of the genomes that were available at the time, and there was about fifty of them. Mm. So, you're looking just at uh, sequences where you have whole genomes. No, these were any genomes that were available. So, okay. they were. Like, the human was very, very good at the time. Mouse was very good. Chimpanzees, very good. Baboon, rhesus were okay. Um, but some of them were little more than a lot of contacts. Um, there might, been, might have been a lot of sequence there, but they were really short and very fragmented. Mm -hmm. So we just went about blasting each one individually, looking for IRV FC. And... Maybe Welkin can elaborate a little bit on this, but there was a good period there after the uh, the rotation students left where I was looking at a sequence, and I'm like, oh, it's in squirrel monkeys. Oh, it's also in lemurs and mm -hmm. pikas and everything. So it was in about half of the, the species that we looked at. Yeah. Um, I think the hard part was getting him to s – knowing when to stop. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like he kept, he was doing this all by hand and he, he kept, uh, you know, genomes were, I think were probably coming out at the time too. They, and they were coming out as I was doing this. You, you could start to imagine this being a 15 year project. If, <laughs> you know, at some point you have, you stop and start making sense of the data. But so, yeah. so how long ago is this? We're talking like four years ago or something like that? <laughs> yeah, this all started in 2010. The very end of 2010, the rotation okay. students started January 2011, I believe. You know, that's something I think uh, uh, I even lose track of, and a lot of our listeners don't necessarily appreciate. This stuff doesn't happen overnight. No, and it certainly <laughs> doesn't. Most of the papers that we talk about, you know, have been cooking for years. This is a good example. That's a long time. It's also a good You know, Ted had other uh, wet bench projects going at the same time too so he was always busy but it's also a good example of how something really interesting happened and initially it was not hypothesis driven it was purely curiosity right, right? it was just keep digging because this is neat stuff and, and i think it was a long time before we had some idea what the what the complete story would be at least that's my memory yes yeah and actually there was a point in time where i don't know we had I think wrapped up what we had thought our data set was going to be. And um, a couple more genomes came out. I think the, the squirrel monkey was one of them. And I don't know, one of the others I think was a, a rodent of some, some flavor. And we thought that it'd be interesting to look to see what was in those as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it really added, oh, I remember what it was. It was the ferret genome. And the inclusion of those sequences actually really helped elucidate what was going on. So I think it was a, a good idea to go back and, and get those sequences in the end from those genomes. Yeah, we love ferrets here on TWIV. I, I don't think they have anything to do with uh, transmission of any particular <laughs> good. viruses. Yeah, there you go. Good. And, and they wouldn't have been ferrets 30 million years ago. It would have been something 
yeah. something ex- leading up to a ferret, I guess. Right. Kathy, you were going to say something? I was just going to say, for the listeners who haven't looked at the abstract of this paper, they're probably going crazy wondering what it is we're going to find. <laughs> because we're just talking about we're adding more and more sequences and we're going to get there. And yeah, we'll get there. So, <laughs> you, you looked at 28 species, right? Is that the right number? I'm looking at your paper at the moment. We found in 28 species representing every superorder of eutherian mammals except Xenarthra, right? Right. So that's that's what we found, Irv F C N. Right. Yes. And you say its absence from the genomes of several eutherian lineages is inconsistent with a single endogenization in a common ancestor of all eutherian mammals. That seems like a pretty important conclusion, right? Right. And that that goes back to my statement earlier that if these things were spread vertically mm-hmm. or spread if they um, originated from um, vertical transmission. Uh, they should have loci that are shared between those those species, and we obviously didn't see that. Right. Okay. Tell us what you did next. Um, so from there, we decided that it would be good. I mean, from there, we knew that cross species transmissions probably played a role in how Irv FC got to all of these species and endogenized. Um, so therefore, we wanted to characterize. Um, all of the different ways that we could to elucidate whether or not that was the case and if we could track back and see any sort of relationship between the the Irv FCs to get Mm -hmm. a bit of a history on where the virus came from, how it spread, um, how it changed over the years, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. What people have, I sort of think of it as taking to the extreme what people have done in searching for where HIV came from in non-human primates. And it's orders of magnitude different in terms of the evolution, but it's the same thought. Mm -hmm. How did it get where it is now? And can we figure out how it's evolved since? So that's that's sort of what we undertook. Um, The first thing that we decided to do in terms of looking at that is just take all the sequences that we had, um, align them all up, and figure out how the virus has changed over time in all these different lineages. Mm -hmm. Um, So the first thing that we did um, really is looking at how conserved each one of the the protein coding sequences are. Um, And one would expect that the, the highly... Um, important RT, the capsid, the other structural genes, those things should be very conserved. Um, And that's what we found. There's very little, um, well, I shouldn't say very little because it's still quite divergent in the scale of like a human gene. Um, But it's in terms of viral evolution, very conserved in those genes. Um, So we show in, in one of our figures that there's very little difference in capsid and matrix and RT and uh, the transmembrane region of envelope. Whereas in other regions, like the, the surface um, uh, portion of envelope, which interacts with um, the receptor and also is the main target of antibodies, is very highly divergent, so much so that you can hardly align them and actually get something that's informative. And this is, again, at the the protein coding sequence. This isn't at the nucleotide level. So it's just crazy diverse. Um, so it's obviously, again, hasn't come from vertical transmission of these, these sequences. Mm-hmm. Um, so then that's sort of taking the whole gene. And the next step was to, to look down at more important motifs and, and subsets of those genes. Um, so one thing that we could do is uh, look for the late domain. Um, those are short sequences like P- PTAP or PSAP, PPPY, um, YPXL uh, motifs. So they're short linear motifs that um, are recognized by host proteins that allow for um, budding incision of the the. Um, budding scission and release of the, the new viruses. 
And we know from HIV and MLV studies, amongst other viruses, that these sequences can be moved around and there's really no limitation to where they're placed so long as that they're there. Um, they can be utilized um, by the, the host machinery. And we found that those motifs are, are highly mobile in these, these viruses. I think I have a list of seven or eight different um, common locations where they could where they could fall in the, the gag protein of, of these sequences. And that was mainly in the P12 region, but also outside of it as well. So again, it argues for um, adaptive evolution taking place, not strictly um, vertical transmission. Um, and then we followed that up by looking structurally at the, the capsid protein, which is, again, the main um, structural subunit of the, the virus. And we, we know a lot about capsid. Did I lose you guys? Uh, uh, we lost Rich, but I'll get him back. Okay. <laughs> um, and we, we have a lot of uh, structures of, of capsid, so we, we know very well what it looks like mm -hmm. and how it evolves. So we thought it was a good testing place to, to look. And we found that the, uh, the interior portion of the, the hexamer is very highly conserved, or the, the sequences in capsid that form that interior portion of the, the hexamer are very highly conserved, whereas the, the surface regions that interact with host proteins and host restriction factors are much more uh, divergent. Again, arguing for adaptive evolution and not strictly vertical transmission of these these viral sequences right so the so the so the the significance of the conservation is that it uh, implies that uh, these viruses were acting as viruses uh, for a long period of time exactly. right not yeah. not as just inactivated genome sequences right if there were inactivated genome sequences and these uh, mutations were arising stochastically you would expect a pretty even um, mm -hmm. level of divergence between those uh, positions in, in capsid or wherever in the, the genome. So the, the, the pattern of frequency is reflecting what we know about the functional regions of the proteins. Exactly. And, and that shouldn't happen if it's just sitting in a, a uh, host genome and mutating very, very slowly over the years, right? Yeah. One right. would not so, expect that to happen. Yes. So in the broadest sense, looking at this question of whether the endogenization happened before the, all these species arose and then speciation, or whether there has been uh, virus replication of this virus in all these different species, this argues for the latter. Correct. Okay. Very strongly argues for the latter, I would right. say. Right. Um, so then we went on from there and did some uh, actual phylogenies to figure out what sequences were most related to others. Um, and we show that there are certainly species in which the, uh, the sequence of ERV FCs are mostly, most closely related, such as um, humans and non-human primates or at least old world primates, they show um, very close, um, sorry, uh, they show very similar viruses in, in their genome. So they probably, even though they're not, you know, vertically transmitted, they probably pass the viruses back and forth between themselves. And we saw the same thing with um, carnivores and, and others. So it, it argues um, for something that we've observed and that cross-species transmissions tend to occur between species more closely related. It's easier to make that, that jump between one species and another if you're more evolutionary sim evolutionarily similar. Um, now, now, you're not saying that there is no um, vertical transmission. It's, it's mixed with uh, infection, right? Because we know right. that in people for the last... And Homo sapiens for however many years this has been inactive, right? Right. So at at this point in time, we're we're mainly ignoring what's gone on after the endogenization event. So these sequences that I'm comparing are what I have tried to discern as being the 
primordial right. Irv FC sequence right. of that type. Um, so we're trying to get a look at what happened you know, 15, 25, mm -hmm. 30 million years ago. You know, there's, um, you know, people use the fossil analogy for these things. And I think a couple months ago when you had Jens Kuhn on, Rich was talking about how they'll reconstruct a Tyrannosaurus Rex from some bones that they find in the dirt. And <laughs> I think what Ted, what Ted has done is he's, he's taken those bones and tried to work backwards to what the virus looked like, what its proteins looked like. And, he, and to do that, he had to undo, you know, 10, 20 million years of sort of degrading evolution that happened after they endogenized in order to reconstruct those genes. Right. 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 To, so, use, to use that analogy, it'd be like finding bits of one bone and reassembling them back into the what the bone looked like before mm -hmm. it was yeah. broken up into little bits. Right. So, so what a lot of people who study herbs do is they study the sequences in our genomes. But what a, what only a smaller group of people have bothered to do, including including Ted, is to actually use those sequences. Literally, think of, not literally, but think of them like fossils and use them to ask what was the virus like before it wound up in our genomes. And that was really is the heart of the paper. Mm -hmm. So are we up to the tanglegram yet? We are getting there, yes. All right, I can't wait. Okay, bring <laughs> us to the tanglegram. I think that's cool. All right, so the, the next thing we wanted to do was to figure out... Uh, more specifically, how these uh, viruses jumped species. And the way that you do that analysis is to compare a known host phylogeny to the phylogeny that we've produced for this virus. You can do the same thing for any, any parasite. Um, so we compared the, the two trees, and you connect the dots between species, right? So you have... I don't know, a mouse or a rat, you connect it from the host to the, the viral sequence, and you look to see where those lines that you're connecting overlap, indicating that there was certainly a cross-species jump that um, happened to put the Irv FC in that particular species. So for the listeners, I'd like to describe it as something like you might have had a matching test in elementary school, where mm -hmm. on the left column you have a list of things and on the right column you have a list of things and you just have to draw a line to connect the things in the left that match with the things in the right. And I knew I knew that was causing me some kind of anxiety looking at it. I never knew why. <laughs> <laughs> what it looks so like. <laughs> so in this case the, the, the things on the left is the the list on the left is actually the phylogeny of the host species and, and there are actually branches of yeah. the of the tree. And then on the right is the list of things, the the various ERV sequences, the viral sequences. Right. And, and then you match those up. Yeah. So this, tell, this tells you that there were cross-species transmissions, but it doesn't tell you who got what from whom. Indeed, yes. Because I, <laughs> the thing that fascinates me about this paper, I want to know where the dolphin got this. Yeah. <laughs> Because he's kind of out there, in particular in this original, in the uh, first <laughs> phylogenetic tree, the dolphin is, well, I'm actually, the dolphin's in a group that... Yes, it's close to ruminants. Yeah. Weird. Sheep, cow, and water buffalo. I mean, but he's what, pretty distant from those, but those are the closest relatives. But what was a dolphin 30 million years ago? Uh, good, qu yeah, good question. Thirty million so years ago, the dolphin may not have even been swimming around in the water, right? Mm -hmm. I, I yeah. looked this up. I believe that dolphins were strictly aquatic thirty million years ago. Is that right? That's right. Or at least yeah. that's what the evidence seems to show from the fossil record. Dang. But, but we don't know that for all species, right? What they were thirty million years ago. No, no, we certainly don't. No. Now in this in this tanglegram, you have some. Let's see. I thought I saw a two different species. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Cause I, I'm, I'm, I'm going blind looking at it, but I thought I saw two different connections, but they can't be, right? Oh, here. Well, th there are. There are some that um, the virus has two lines going to the, the host. Right, right. Um, and that's where the endogenization occurred. Prior to speciation, yeah, 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 and then you have some where the host has two lines going to two different viruses, 
And that's where two different viruses independently endogenize that single mm-hmm. host. So yeah, just there, like, there are just some like, that have two. Like humans have HIV-1 and HIV-2 as separate cross-species transmission events. Yep. Something like that probably happened. Right. It's pretty cool that you can figure that out by looking at the host and the virus, right? Right. And using that plus a number of other molecular criteria, we sort of guesstimate that there was about um, 26 independent cross-species transmissions to mm-hmm. explain all of the viruses that are in these species. Now, uh, if you, now if you just looked at humans, yep. what, what's the number? Uh, just two. Just there's, two. Well, there's two lineages of IRVFC. Yeah, there you go. Right. And both of those lineages are more similar, not to one another, but to viruses of old world primates. Mm-hmm. So it looks like there was one lineage of virus that spread between old world primates and humans and a separate that spread between old world primates and, and humans. So when you say spread between old world primates, so the two were around at the same time and humans got it from a, a primate? Is that or cool? vice versa, yes. Or vice versa. Uh, Except it wouldn't have been it wouldn't, wouldn't have, been have been monkeys been humans, and humans. Yeah. Yeah, no. yeah whatever. It, it, it's not even Homo sapiens you're saying, right? Right. Right. This, this was many millions of years ago, so Got it. Um, that would be probably about the split from us and mm-hmm. gorillas, I think, um, for one yeah. of the lineages and even earlier for the other. Are there any, do we know of any endogenizations that occurred in Homo sapiens? I know that yes. uh, yeah. it's outside of FC, right? You mean exclusively? No, no. I mean, other than FC, because obviously it's, it's not for FC, but because there are other e- herbs that went into Homo sapiens, correct? Uh, yes. Herb K is polymorphic. It has certain loci that are polymorphic in the, the human genome. Got it. But that's a reseeding from genome sequences that already exist. Mm-hmm. I guess so, it depends if you're asking exclusive to humans or in the human genome because there's there's hundreds of thousands of sequences in the human genome but they they go back far enough that they're shared with other primates yeah i want to know if any came into homo sapiens not previous yeah. and, so know. i think the the herve k that ted's talking about right it, i think the estimates are in the last couple million years maybe yeah. or that, even younger or younger yeah so that would there still are, uh, that would still predate Homo sapiens then. Right? Um, but there might be, yeah, there are some that seem to be unique to humans. There's some that are shared with Neanderthals, for example, which would mm-hmm. only be, you know, a couple tens of thousands of years ago. And there are still some loci that actually will occasionally uh, they get transcribed and sometimes even make mm-hmm. defective proteins and some right, tissues. Right. So that was what I was going to ask you: Is there any evidence for sh- for cross species? transmission between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals? And you said maybe, right? Um, Well, in that case, we're talking about sequences that are shared because they would have been in a common ancestor of humans and Neanderthals. I don't... I know that's an interesting question, actually. I wonder if there... I wonder if there's even enough data. Yeah. It's It's also difficult to pick that out if you have... uh, Breeding between the two species, so Mm -hmm. you could get it by cross-species transmission, or you could just get it because you picked it up through the the mating. I mean, I guess you could tell the if if the if the herbs are separate from the shared genome sequences, right? Because there may be islands that are clearly uh, recombinant and that may be separate or not. But I don't know if there's enough data to look at that. It's it's hard. The um, the herbs tend to to hang out in truly non coding sequence, and that's mm-hmm. the the poorest sequence out there, um, especially for sequences like um, Neanderthals that have been strictly done with Illumina sequencing. Right. They get really right. short reads, and it's very hard to piece together what's going on in the non coding sequence. Mm-hmm. That's very transposable, element rich. <clears throat> I think. So. I think. Um uh, the other thing you did here was to estimate the time scale of this, right? Right, yes. How did you do that? Uh, so we utilized the, f- the fact that 
upon integration, the, the machinery for integration dictates that um, the five prime and the three prime LTRs of the, the virus have to be identical. Mm-hmm. Um, so once it's into the genome, it will degrade at a known rate that's proportional to the, the neutral evolution rate of a, the host. And we use that LTR divergence um, in each one of these individual loci to figure out how old each loci, each locus is in that genome, or estimate. I mean, we don't know with any certainty, but it's a decent estimate of how old that that locus is. Um, And we we found that the the IRVFC infections, or at least endogenizations, probably started either just prior to the Oligocene or within the Oligocene. And that's somewhere around 35 million years ago um, to about 22 million years ago. Um, so the original, or the, the original, the oldest IRV FCs are from carnivores, and they're, they're pushing that 35 million year range. Um, so it's, it's right at the, the boundary of the Oligocene, which is interesting because that period of time marked a uh, big shift in the, the global climate and um, big changes in the, the species that were there and mm. um, what they were feeding on and, and all that. So, it would so is, a, is, it, is it fair to say then that this thing may have originated in carnivores and spread ultimately to all of these other species? That is possible, yes. And you're thinking of eating, right, Rich? No, I'm just thinking of just <laughs> well, be, spread one way or another. Yeah. If you're if you're looking at it in terms of feeding, it would be easier to see how the carnivores acquired it yeah. from so other was, species uh, right. rather than vice versa. Yeah. I, that's what I was thinking because that's the main contact, right, among animals yeah. when right. one chases another and eats it. Right. Right. Otherwise, you know, within a certain species, if they're living together, obviously that can transmit it like mice, but uh, uh, being a carnivore would certainly initiate it, yeah. Yeah, so so we dated the initial endogenization events to somewhere around 35 million years ago in, in carnivores and in New World primates somewhere around 30 million years ago. Um, and that, that extends all the way down to about 20 million years um, for the most recent endogenization event. Mm which, again, was in a carnivore, the dog. Um, so it's, it's interesting that at one end of the spectrum, the carnivore is like the oldest, and also a carnivore is one of the youngest, um, or has one of the youngest or FC endogenization events. Hmm. It's you don't have my buddy the dolphin on here. <laughs> <laughs> no, unfortunately, the dolphin genome sequence... Um, was just contigs, so it didn't really contain any hmm. loci that had two LTRs that we could do this analysis uh, with. Okay. Um, so you know we're, what's... we're limited here to genomes that were fairly intact that yeah. we could find full loci and, and do these. What's really kind of amazing to about this to me, or I, I keep struggling with it, is that the when you do the reading, you know, the, these the ancestors of these species were pretty much spread all over the the world at the time, mm-hmm. right? And when we think of viruses going global, we often talk about that's because of air travel and human involvement. But this is, I mean, it's a different time scale, but it's clear that, that viruses were able to migrate all over the planet, mm-hmm. um, you know, f- by various means, which is still, it's sort of a gap in our understanding of how this happened, but... It's not true that globalization is a phenomenon of the modern era. Uh, well, uh, Australia's excluded from this one. Is that right? Yes. Do I have that right? So, yes. the, or at least the, the, the animals, the species that we now associate exclusively with Australia don't, don't have these things. So maybe well, that's also- a, at least a partial clue is to spread. It implies that there's some geography involved. Correct. Australia also doesn't have any eutherian mammals. Mm-hmm. Natively. Okay. Um, All right. So that could be a, a problem as well. But right. we, we do know certain instances where geography clearly played a role. 
Um, so in our one of our trees, figure four, um, actually in two of our trees, you can see that within a subclade of the um, gag and Paul trees, right next to the dolphin sequence, there's a squirrel. Mm. So the 13-line ground squirrel, there's the pika, and then there's the European rabbit. Well, the European rabbit only got to the old world about 12 million years ago. Before that, it was in North America, along with the pika and the 13-line ground squirrel. So all three of those make a cluster of, of viral sequences. So it's fairly certain that they passed it, well, not them, but their progenitor species passed it amongst themselves in a geographically limited mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. manner. Mm -hmm. So we, we do see evidence of that, but we also see evidence where there's species from completely different areas of the world getting very similar viruses. This is an interesting question when you think about human infections, right? When you know humans arose in Africa and moved to Europe and Asia, and they had their own set of viruses, and they remained with them until crossing the ocean by colonizers brought them to the New World. But before right. that, they did not get there. And so they didn't get there via animals, obviously. So that, And that's, a, of course, a compressed period of time compared with what you're talking about here. Maybe given millions of years, <laughs> you know, you could spread around the globe, but, right. not, but not hundreds of thousands or a hundred thousand. Uh, how, how does this time scale? I I can't put this time scale in together with continental drift. <laughs> I'm close. During this time, were the plates moving around so that the geography was actually different? The plates moved around quite substantially during this time. Mm. Um, up until about three to five million years ago, um, North and South America um, were totally separate entities. Um, South America, up until maybe 10 million years ago, was linked to um, Antarctica, actually. Hmm. Um, so it had a way to get to, well, it, species on South America had a way to get to Antarctica, but not to North America. Okay. Um, and North America, throughout this time period, had land bridges that would spontaneously um, form between... Asia and North America, um, and that happened over and over again. So, any time um, glaciation happened, there would be a land bridge, and you could mm. get funnel mixture. Um, Europe and Asia were separate at the time, as well as Africa and Europe and Asia. So they were all sort of separate entities that would form. Um, bridges at certain periods of time, usually with um, decrease in the, the global uh, water level, sea level of the time. So I think the, I think the dolphin, I think the dolphin is the vector. <laughs> <laughs> You're starting to sound like Kevin dolphin. McCarty in our lab. He, he had a dolphining platform. He swore that Irv FC was spread by dolphins. <laughs> so well, Rich, Rich, good. Rich, tell me how the dolphins got it on land. <laughs> uh, somebody ate sea the world. dolphin. Somebody ate the dolphin. Okay. Sea world. There you go. Ted, did you is, we, did you have a hobby in paleogeography, or did you learn that for this project? I studied it for this project. It's pretty cool that you can connect yeah. viruses and plate tectonics, right? <laughs> well, we actually thought we could narrow down where the virus actually originated by doing these these studies, but in, in the end, it's just too old and it was too yeah. complicated. Perhaps if we found a, a virus that didn't seem to spread quite so rapidly and effectively, we could do that. But this one went global fairly quickly and seems to have spread back and forth between the continents. Mm -hmm. Ted, is there anything else we should cover that we've missed? Yeah, recombination. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yes, recombination. Um, one of the things that I didn't talk about is that um, we found good evidence in the, uh, the phylogen phylogeny from envelope that um, there's been mixing and matching of the envelope sequence between members of IRV FC as well as between IRV FC and members of other viruses. Mm. 
Um, so we found that um, Irv FC mixed clearly at least twice with Herv W and picked up the Herv W envelope. And Herv W is the most closely related envelope to Irv FC. So it's easy to think about that it was a fairly small genetic barrier to obtain this, this viral envelope and get a new host range or a new uh, tropism that way. Hmm. But clearly it, it occurred in carnivores once as well as in, in tarsiers. Um, so we have evidence for that. We also have evidence that um, IRV FC gave its envelope to a beta retrovirus, so a virus from a completely different uh, genera of retroviruses. And in both mouse and rat genome, we found evidence for that. And those two genomes did not have the same virus with that envelope. So it's unclear if that occurred once or if that occurred twice. Mm -hmm. um, but we certainly see that, that it has occurred. Um, and Jamie Henze in the lab has a pretty good paper um, discussing how gamma retroviruses seem to have a very broad tropism, whereas others are more restricted, such as uh, beta retroviruses. So it seems to be easier for the gammas to give up their envelopes to broaden uh, uh, viral tropism for other viruses mm -hmm. rather than vice versa. Um, so we found that, and then in carnivores, we were actually able to trace a very complicated series of uh, cross-species transmission events that once the, the IRV FC had picked up the, the HERV W-like envelope, it then got back into a number of species, including dogs and ferrets, and seems to, in both of those cases, uh, recombined um, to gain a gag of the pre-existing type. So hmm. f for this paper, we're calling the, the chimeric virus IRVFC1 and the prototypical IRVFC, IRVFC2. So it's an IRVFC1, is, which is already recombined to gain an W envelope, has again recombined to gain an IRVFC2 gag. Um, and the thinking there is that it would need to interact better with the, the host restriction factors or the host um, proteins that are interacting with capsid and, and other structural proteins um, in order for efficient replication. So we, we thought that it was a very interesting um, history of recombination there that we really wanted to highlight in the paper. And re recombination is occurring when you have co-infection of a cell with two different viruses, right? Or, yeah, co-packaging, yes. Yeah, co-packaging yeah. from a producer cell, right? So there are two proviruses in a, in a right. genome, so, and they're both packed, yeah. Right, so it's unclear whether this is going to be exogenous virus. Mm -hmm. So the, the older one is IRVFC2 in this lineage. So it's unclear if that was an exogenous virus at that time or if it was just uh, sequences that were already endogenized and being produced um, for new retrotransposition, except it got picked up in a heterologous exogenous virus and recombined that way. Um, so it's, it's unclear mm -hmm. at what state that Irv FC2 was at the time. This is done in mammals, right? These were all done in mammals, yes. Could do it in other species as well, right? Like, we looked for Irv FC outside of mammals and didn't, didn't find it. Or you could, or other herbs, I guess, could be done in other animals, right? Certainly, yeah. certainly. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, Ted, you're not working on this anymore, right? You've moved on to uh, different things. Is that correct? You, you didn't bring it with you, right? I did not bring this with me, no. So, Welkin, where's this going? Now, if you don't want to tell <laughs> us, that's fine. But oh no, I'm I'm happy to. Uh, I, the other thing that Ted found, or one of the more more um, additional interesting things, was that about. I, I want to say about nine different modern species. Um, he found. Is everyone still there? Yeah, we're here. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. He still found individual instances where an envelope, an Irv FC viral envelope gene, was still completely intact from start codon to stop codon, even hmm. when the provirus surrounding it was clearly old and highly degraded, and that 
that would strongly suggest that that particular envelope gene has been preserved by selection for yeah. some it sure some does purpose. Yeah. yeah wow and um so so when ted was still here he worked with a uh, kate Holm, who's a graduate student in the lab who's actually reconstructed some of these envelope proteins um and is looking at them functionally uh, pseudotyping MLV so she can look at, you know, host range, uh, figure out if the receptor still exists, for example, mm. so that we can reconstruct some of the history. And um, some of that's been done before. Paul Benash's lab has mm-hmm. done stuff like that. Right. Um, uh, Thierry Heidman's lab. But what's I- interesting in this case is because there's these eight or nine different independent preservations of this envelope protein in different host lineages at different times that might be separated by millions of years, in theory, one could look at how receptor usage has changed over time. Mm -hmm. You know, when the virus is spreading globally, is it, is it adapting to the, is it using the same receptor or is it switching receptors as it does this? I mean, that's a big, that's almost a fantasy project, but that's um, ultimately where that might play out. If the envelope protein is being conserved, so there's some positive selection on that, but the rest of the genes, GAG and RT, in that uh, endogenous retrovirus are going to seed. What's the envelope doing? What's the selective pressure? Host. So, so I, I, there's a couple of different things. So Ted mentioned um, the mammalian syncytin proteins, the ones that are yeah. viral proteins that have been involved in, in placental development right. is one possibility but I think in this case um, so the other possibility there's examples of in mice is an envelope protein could be preserved because its expression could dominantly mm-hmm. dominant negatively interfere with the ability of other viruses to use the same receptor uh-huh. mm-hmm. and there's an, a gene in mice was the, f- the first example of this was a gene in mice called FV4 which can block infection by exogenous right. MLVs that use the same receptor. So I, okay. I, I think that's the most likely, something like that is probably the most likely explanation. Um, so some of these are in mice, so you could disrupt them and see what happens, right? Were they in mice? I don't um, think mouse. No. It was, it was a weird grab bag. Aardvark, I'm looking at the figure. <laughs> Aardvark, dog, panda. There were yeah. two in lemur, is that right? I think there were two in lemur, yes. Uh, squirrel, monkey, marmoset, baboon, and then humans. Humans and chimpanzees share one that's still an envelope open reading frame in yeah. our own genome. So, And the, in, in most cases, how, how intact are these uh, herbs? I mean, can you, can you see all three in, in any given insertion? Can you see all three genes but just highly degraded? Or their bits, or what? So your question presumes that we have good genomic sequence, which we don't in some of these. Ah, uh, so you just get um, bits. So for the the species where we do have decent genome uh, sequence that we can go to, we have a variety. Some of them are quite intact, and they're easy to work with. Um, some of them are. Very, very degraded. Um, The worst was by far the mouse and rat. So they share um, loci, mouse and and rat, share IRVFC loci. And those loci have degraded over 20 million years of evolution that mice mice and rat split. And in uh, that lineage, the the greater... um, rodent lineage is a very high um, neutral evolution rate. So those loci were very degraded. And it was very difficult to figure out much at all about the IRV FC in those species. So I just got like little bits of RT and, and that's about it. Okay. Mm. Capsid. Well, can you could... Others uh, were very, very good. You, you could look at it if the envelope is... Act- protein is actually produced and so forth in cells though, right? You could do things like yeah. that. So that that is kind of what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so we can, in some cases, express the protein, mm-hmm. um, and then ask whether or not it's uh, still processed correctly and whether it's still functional. And so some of that early data suggests that the protein uh, probably can't still function as a viral envelope protein, but can still interact with its receptor. 
And that's why we're leaning towards the, the hypothesis or the explanation that it's probably was uh, selected at some point as a basically as a restriction factor, mm. as a way of conferring resistance. Yeah, yeah. This is so neat, and this is something you can only do with retroviruses, right? Because because the uh, that it's a required part of the replication cycle. It's not like just bits of viral DNA pieces randomly inserted. I mean, that tells you things, but here you can look at function. Right. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. It's very cool. Um, I. They, you know, I think you've talked about it on the show. They have discovered that uh, quite a few other viruses do leave sequences behind. Yeah. What's unique about retroviruses is because it's actually part of the replication cycle. We have more complete. We have a larger data set and more complete data. You know, right. proviruses that still have the entire genome. Right. Now, me, I wanted to ask you one more thing. What would it help to have more and more? Uh, animal genome sequences would this make more for more precision and more information or do we have as much as we need sounds like no but i want to hear what you guys say oh yeah the more the better <laughs> okay <laughs> definitely i most welcome yeah, yeah we, we probably could have gotten down a lot to a finer detail if we had many more s sequences available mm -hmm. especially from certain really interesting lineages like uh the non-human primates and the prosimians and stuff. Those could have been really cool. But was, yeah, what's hard sometimes is, is, is genomes are picked to represent different groups, but yeah. in some cases you'd like multiple genomes from the same group. Right. You know, it would be nice to have multiple old world monkey genomes instead of just, at the time, just rhesus and baboon. You know, because if you want to look more recently in time, then you have to look at species that are more closely related to one another. Yeah, well, of course, the sequencing becomes cheaper than anyone. You know, if you, yeah. if you wanted a, a certain repetition, you could almost do it yourself as long as you got the cells, right? Right. Yep. And, and for instance, what we found, the recombination story that we found in carnivores, if we didn't have, you know, a couple of additional carnivore sequences, we never would have found that. Yeah, so if we if we had more in some of the other lineages, we probably would have found similar stories elsewhere. So do you keep an eye on this new sequences, uh, Welkin, that that come out um, because of this? <laughs> I don't really, but there are people who um, Rob Gifford. I don't know if you yeah, met Rob. Yes, I but have. Rob yeah. Gifford is um, uh, he's written a suite of programs. He he's a very good programmer, very good um, at at sort of scanning through genomes. Uh, on a, using his dig software and mm. so we sort of rely on him to tell us when there's new and interesting things cropping up um, it's great. i i just have to put a disclaimer in here too so throughout this whole episode ted kept saying we and we actually means him i didn't <laughs> <laughs> i didn't do any of this i'm, I'm happy to put my name on the paper because it looks good for me but but the work was ted's thank you a lot of work yeah, yeah. it's great yeah, good work, Ted. Thank you. All right. Did we miss anything that's important before we move on? Oh, we could go on for hours. <laughs> it, it sounds to me like it sounds to me like you got pretty sucked into this, Ted. Yeah, yeah. I was well. I was already halfway down the rabbit hole from Eric's lab before I I got to Welkin's. So uh -huh. I, I sort of grew an affinity to non-coding sequences and Irv's. Um, from a, a separate story. So, yeah, it I was just, easy to get I started. could just see getting totally into this and just, you know, living and breathing it for a period of time. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing you, you can say is that it's less expensive than wet experiments, right? Yeah. You don't need a big lab. You just need a computer and internet. And so, uh, you know, you don't have to buy pipetmin or serum or whatever. Right, yeah, but it, no. it, it would be nice to be able to go back and do some wet lab experiments yeah, of to, to figure out um, some of the observations that we made indicate that, for instance, like the, the P12 region may be a place where it interacts with host factors, and that's why it's evolved so quickly. Yeah, yeah. So if we could, you know, get a virus that replicated, which we tried and failed pretty spectacularly... <laughs> um, but if if we could get something that replicated, we could then test the P12 region and see how it interacts with yeah. you know, its host species cells and with its heterologous cells from some other species. Um, you can start getting at those those questions. But 
Um, not until you actually do the wet lab can you address anything molecularly yeah, and functionally. Yeah. Uh, Ted, do you? I, I presume you want to have a lab of your own one day. Is that is that what your plans include? That's the goal. Would you go back to this at some point? You think? I certainly would. Yeah. Because uh, I presume you're working on HIV related project now, right? In Jeremy's lab. I have many projects in Jeremy's lab, but my main project is actually looking at ERV, well, HERV, mm-hmm. Human Endogenous Retrovirus, yeah. HERV-H, um, which is grossly overexpressed in embryonic stem cells, mm-hmm. pluripotent cells. And we're trying to figure uh, out right. if yeah. it has any function yeah. in being so overexpressed. Yeah, that was a, Jeremy published a paper years ago showing that that was a marker for pluripotency, Right, right. Right. And, and then, other people are doing similar research. Yeah. Well. We did a paper on TWIV about how it's thought to be a long non-coding RNA, right, that's involved in pluripotency. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we'll look forward to your paper on that. Thank you. I look forward <laughs> to having a paper on that. <laughs> I'm sure, yes. Uh, I wanted to um, just briefly talk about a paper that a, a number of people have asked us to talk about, which has nothing to do with... Um, what we've just talked about, but which I think Welkin and Ted might be interested in. This was published in the Journal of Applied Microbiology, and it's called Evaluation of the Potential for Virus Dispersal During Hand Drying, the Comparison of Three Methods. And, I, you know, I, I travel a lot, and this, this resonates with me. Basically, you know, we're supposed to wash our hands, and if you go to a public bathroom, you either get paper towels, you get the, the dryers that put warm air downwards and then more recently of course uh and these are the ones i always see these dyson things you know i think dyson makes those really good vacuum cleaners right yeah (laughs) and uh they make this blower you put your hands in and it blows up air very high uh, velocity air up i use these all the time and i always think man this is blowing right in my face (laughs) is that bad uh so what they did here is they had people Rinse their hands in a solution of M- MS2 bacteriophage, right? Their hands were gloved. Too, they were gloved remember? too? Okay. Oh, gloved hands. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, well, that's actually a good point because maybe that's, you know, that's okay. Oh, I have some more data on other good. papers I'll tell you about. Um, and then they, uh, they, they did a number of sampling. So they had the people either uh, wash, the, dry their hands on paper towels, on the warm air dryers, and on the Dyson. And then they set up. Uh, petri plates on this piece of wood nearby so that they could collect the phages and then they just covered them and incubated them and counted plaques. They also sampled the air um, with an air sampler. And they based- and, then, and that did a high pressure thing onto their uh, indicator plates for the phage. Right. Uh, so, it, and the funny thing is too that instead of calling it soft auger or top auger like I yeah. used to do. They call it sloppy auger. Yeah, notice that. So then that. they talk about this plate that's spinning, and it's got sloppy auger, and I'm just thinking of it spinning off, but whatever. Yeah. So. Basically, the, the, the Dyson dispersed much more uh, virus particles compared to the other two. I mean, the, the, the paper towels were really insignificant, very low plaques and dispersal of the phage. But as you might expect, this Dyson... Uh, throws around uh, a lot of PFU. And this paper, as a, as a consequence, has made all the popular press and everyone is is uh, talking about it. So I thought we'd just throw out our thoughts about it. So they, Wash they, your hands. <laughs> they, uh, they create this image in the sort of setup for this that you see all the time with people, I think, feeling socially compelled to wash their hands yeah. in a public place uh, after using the toilet and but not really they don't really care so they come out and they turn on the water and they just kind of <laughs> run their hands under the water they don't really wash them so you still got a lot of contamination then you go over and use this air blade it just blows it all over the place and it this never occurred to me Un- unlike you vincent this never occurred to me because i always love these hand dryers because they really <laughs> work well but uh, today I was in the gym and I had a totally different perspective on this now. And I noticed that there's even uh, there's a, a place on the bottom, okay, where you, you initially put your hands in and they're dripping. Yeah. yeah. And there's, it's wet in the bottom. So yeah. even the guy before you who used the, the, 
the hand dryer, you go in and the hand dryer's contaminated. Yeah, okay. And, it, yeah, and yeah. it blows it all up into your face and all over the place. And the the magnitude of the effect is is huge. We're talking yeah. I mean, not just a little difference, a big difference between uh the Dyson Airblade and the and the regular hand dryer and the paper towel. Now they did not actually wash their hands with soap, right? They just rinsed them, correct? That's right. Yeah, they soaked it, them, in, and and they do they do talk about this. The uh, I love reading this phage stuff. The the <laughs> MS two the MS two lysate that they soak them in has a titer of uh, ten to the tenth <laughs> uh, good old PMU phage. per mil. Good old so phage. that's a lot of phage. On the other hand, they point out that you know um, uh, feces from a norovirus infection probably doesn't have a dissimilar titer. Right, yeah. and it doesn't now take not, very many noroviruses. Yeah, right. To, now you're not means. bathing your hands in that, but still, it, what they're pointing out is that it's it's not an unreasonable uh, experiment, and they're getting thousands of PFU on a plate. Right. Um, right. So at at all distances, the jet air dryer dispersed further, and the highest number of virus was uh, detected from the air jet air dryer. However, if you go back in history, which I did, um, these, there's papers on this going back at least till, to 1987. There's a paper in 1987 on hot electric hand dryers compared with paper towels for spread of bacteria. This is from the UK. Um, and they concluded that hot air hand dryers appear safe from a bacteriological viewpoint. Hmm. There's a paper in 1991 from Canada and they tested undried hands, paper dried, cloth dried, electric warm air, and they used human rotavirus. Wow. Okay. Whoa. Yeah. Irrespective of the hand washing agent used, electric, hair dry, uh, electric air drying produced the highest and cloth drying the lowest reduction in the numbers of both test organisms. So the point is that uh, they were looking at how much bacteria you get off with these different methods and uh, or how much you how much bacteria you have remaining and with the warm air method you have much less remaining than with the paper towel okay mm -hmm. that's the 1991 paper from Canada then there's a paper from 2000 from the Mayo Clinic from Rochester is where the research was actually done they analyzed four hand drying methods for bacteria randomized trial conclusion no statistically significant differences in the efficiency of four different hand drying methods. And uh, they use cloth towels from a rotary dispenser, paper towels, warm forced air, and spontaneous room air evaporation. Okay. Then there's another paper in 2000 where they looked at um, warm air hand dryers with respect to hand hygiene in the washroom environment. And this one uh, again was from the UK. They're really into this in the UK. Um, this one, uh, warm air hand dryers are a hygienic method of drying hands and therefore appropriate for use in both the healthcare and food industry. So uh, they were no more likely to generate airborne microorganisms than drying with paper towels. And then there is a paper in 2014. I, and I think this is one that I had already heard about um, in the Journal of Hospital Infection, where uh, they conclude that this one also looked at jet air and warm air hair dryers, and it increased the bacterial aerosolization when drying hands, suggesting that these dryers might be unsuitable for use in healthcare settings. Hmm. And what I think about the jet ones is that they're they're just really loud. They're really bad for your hearing, too. <laughs> um, and then finally, uh, at least in 2005, there was a review article all about hand hygiene. It has a long section about... Uh, drying methods, and they basically say that the data are equivocal on various things. Um, but they look at the effects of having rings, wristwatches, nail polish, hand art tattoos, all kinds of things. So, well, these Dysons are in uh, uh, Penn, uh, to Penn Station in D.C. where I go a lot. You can't avoid them. There's no paper towels, and I never like them. And I always, you know, someone is always in front of me, and I go, oh, boy, I have to get his... <laughs> Yeah, viruses or bacteria. I so I'm not really a f a fan of them because it blows it really strongly straight up. However, on the other hand, do we have any epidemiological evidence that suggests that outbreaks occur from these things? And I don't think the we we have yeah. any, right? No, I don't. I don't think we do. But the potential is there. But yeah, 
it it sounds like you probably get the most bacteria off if you use these jet dryers. It's just that you spread it out to everybody else. <laughs> So, that Penn that Penn Station room is bad too because it's a really long, narrow hallway full of those blowers. Yeah, yeah. You walk by like ten of them coming and going. Yeah. Uh, so I, um, and you know, if you washed your hands really well, maybe it wouldn't disperse. You, yeah. you never get everything off, you know. And most right. people, rich, you're right. They just rinse their hands. Right. <laughs> but you do have to wash because. You don't want fecal contamination going everywhere. You got to wash your hands. But there has to be a better way. It would be better if instead of air, there would be something you could put your hand in, which would basically, I don't know, irradiate them and dry them and disinfect them. But then that would be bad for you, I suppose. So. The, interestingly, the 1991 paper shows that tap water is not that much different from the from soap, using soap. Uh, liquid soap. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. In this paper, I think they said you had to use soap or something. That water is not good enough. <laughs> I saw I saw a bit recently that compared um, uh, two different methods of hand washing. One, the, the CDC has a method that's been around for a long time that's really laborious, goes on forever. Mm. Okay, and apparently there's some new study that says you know just doing a vigorous job of washing your hands. They didn't go into detail about uh, exactly what it involved, but it was as good as the CDC method. But it's using either detergent or hand sanitizer. And C the two were the same. The CDC has not said anything about this. You know, they're the ones who should lead, right? Yeah. And tell us, is this bad or not? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if we heard something from the CDC eventually. I would like to. Uh, Ted, do you have any thoughts about this? <laughs> I, not really. I prefer the, the hand dryer. I, yeah. I'm not really worried about the bacteria and whatnot, and I think it's probably better for the environment. Certainly. But, uh, it, it, I, I hope that people have used soap. I know most of them. <laughs> yeah. Some of them do. Um, the, the other comment I have is that this was actually a, a thing that Mythbusters tested mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, and they, they came to the same conclusion that the, the blow-dried air tends to get bacteria around the, ba around the bathroom. Um. So it's certainly not just published reports. Other people have popularized it as well. You know, some of these warm air dryers that blow down, at least in the old days, you would have to punch a big button to get it started, right? More, yep. more recently, they go on automatically, but I never liked punching that button, right? And so the Dyson, I say, oh, I don't have to punch any button, but it's got its negatives, obviously. Yeah, those old school ones, though, took like five minutes to actually... Yeah, yeah. I tell you, Dyson vacuums are really good, though. <laughs> they are really very powerful, and they fill up very quickly because they pull a lot of dust in. Anyway, let us know what you think about this interesting story. Paul uh, sent an email, and he wrote, he sent a link to an Ars Technica story about this, and he said, even plaque assays, because <laughs> he knows here on TWIV, we like plaque assays. This episode of TWIV is brought to you by ASV. American Society for Virology, and they want you to know about their annual meeting to be held this year in Blacksburg, Virginia, at Virginia Tech University, June 18th through the 22nd, organized by XJ Meng and Zach Edelman. The keynote address this year will be given by Dr. Stephen Russell on oncolytic viral therapy, and there'll be five days of symposia, workshops, poster sessions, and state-of-the-art lectures. Come listen to Dr. Joe Handelsman talk about leading the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. You can hear a live TWIV and enhance your presentation skills at the Career Development Workshop. Of course, this year we will have a special Zika virus oral workshop and poster sessions, and they've issued a call for late-breaking Zika abstracts deadline of May 16th. Early registration with reduced rates ends May 20th. Go to asv.org or asv2016.cpe.vt.edu and hope to see all of you there. And Kathy, of course, is heading the program committee, and that's a lot of work, right? Right. So when you said they issued the call for the late pre That was you? That was Stacy and me, yes. <laughs> well, thank you for all your work. I'm looking forward to it. And I will see you there. We'll see Rich Condit there. We will do a TWIV on the Monday of the meeting. Let us do some picks of the week. Since it's late, we will not read any email today. Uh, Rich, what do you have? 
Uh, I have a thing that I just found at random, I think, on <laughs> Facebook. Uh, and it's from a uh, one of these Facebook sites, actually, called Nerd360 Grouse. And uh, I don't even know what the whether this is, it looks like Portuguese site. I think this is Portuguese. All, so I, all I have is this video, okay? And I don't even know how to describe it. It involves an articulated rod on a fulcrum that's got a hinge in it and a ball bearing running back and forth that's weighted. And you just, you just have to look at it, but it looks to me like a perpetual motion machine. Mm -hmm. I, the thing just goes, have you looked at this? Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. just goes forever it goes, and it ever. Goes until he and it stops seems it. to me that yeah. you ought to be able to hook this up to something and get it to go forever. I don't I don't understand it. I want because I thought perpetual motion machines weren't happening. They aren't happening. But, th but this can't. looks like it. Yeah, it can't be right. I that's what I told myself. It can't be right. So at any rate, have a look at this video and uh Tell me it ain't so. I mean, it, or, it keeps going. I mean, I can see that, but I'm not sure you could harness that for anything. I don't, you he know. stops it after 20 seconds. What if he left it for overnight? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't Probably know. <laughs> Could be. People, At any rate, uh, people uh, are into the, it. <laughs> the rest of this site is uh, interesting, too. They have all sorts of little things that's worth looking through. All right. Or I found it worth looking through. Amusing. Thank you, Rich. I don't know. Do you have too much time on your hands? Uh, I, you could say that, I <laughs> suppose. Yeah, <laughs> Kathy, what do you have? I picked a thing from Vox.com that uh, Adam Loring sent me. I think he found it on Twitter. Um, it's a nice graphic and explanation about r not, and it shows uh, Zika, I think, was the one that's right at the top, and that was because I had asked if anybody had done any r not calculations yet. Um, uh, somewhere between 3 and 6.6. Ebola, two, seasonal flu, 1.3. And the r naught, as you know, if, is the number of uh, other people that one sick person is likely to infect. So if it's the number is greater than one, then the virus will be transmitted and if the, uh, or perpetuated. And if the virus, if the r naught is less than one, then that won't happen. And of course, measles is uh, very high, 11 to 18. <clears throat> it's just a nice graphic. And then they go through and describe that r naught. Uh, can vary depending on uh, the geographical location, um, uh, the s susceptibility of people, and uh, just a lot of different things. So it depends on the context, for example. So I thought it was just a short, nice thing and helpful if you ever have to describe or not to someone. Uh, that is nice. And uh, Zika is, of course, they say that they don't have enough data yet, really. Right. But the preliminary data, it's right up there. Mm -hmm. You know, they did this when Ebola had the outbreak in the last two years, I remember, in a slightly different format at the New Yorker, but same idea. And uh, it's good. And the, they say here, as you say, the R0 is never, uh, what is the word they use? I, I lost it. Is never... Mm, it's never final. Thank it's never you. Final. The number can change with every outbreak. Thank Even you. the R not for individual viruses can vary wildly depending on the context. Uh, so, what are the different colors here, Kathy? Do you know? Or is the, uh, the, the black the, black is the, the, the index. black is the one person, and then the red is the definite number or is the minimum, and then the pink uh, 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 are okay. the uh, right. upper range. All right. Yeah. Ted, what do you have? I have an extension from the discussion you had last week or what I thought was a good extension from what you had last week, um, an NPR report that is entitled Accidental Brilliance in Science. <laughs> um, and it's kind of going over, you know, what I, I happened upon in the IRV FC story is that you don't necessarily have to have a hypothesis when you go into something. If you follow it up and it doesn't make sense, you can get at a point where the, the data shows that Something really cool has happened, and they have a whole list, I think, of about 12 of these instances mm, that's nice. um, from the last year where um, people have found stuff that they weren't looking for at all, or they, they found something entirely different than they were looking for, 
And that's maybe even more interesting than what they were looking for in the first place. Yeah, I think uh, Firestein had mentioned a book of like 500 accidental discoveries. Uh, yeah, he, uh, Firestein had a whole library of stuff that sounds like uh, good reading. In fact, the first I, quote of this article is from Isaac Asimov, and, and Stuart read it last week. The most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discoveries, is not Eureka, but that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yes, welcome. I like the, uh, the one about the guy who discovered frog toxins excruciating pain spread up Jared's arm and for the next five hours he was in agony. I don't think he was saying that's funny. No. <laughs> he was probably screaming something else. Yes, you're right. But it wasn't Eureka. <laughs> no, no. Welkin, what do you have? Um, so, uh, mine's either a person or a book or both. Uh, this was actually recommended by Jamie Henze, who's a postdoc in my lab. And the person is a woman, a scientist at University of Hawaii named Hope Jaron. And the book is called Lab Girl. And it's, um, so I've started to read it. I haven't, I haven't got very far into it, but it's a very personal sort of biography of, of her life and how she came to be a scientist. And it's also, I, in a way, about being a, a woman scientist and growing up when she did. And I just, I, I have a quote here that I didn't put in the, the Google Doc, but I wanted to read it. Um, so she she writes, when I was five, I came to understand that I was not a boy. I still wasn't sure what I was, but it became clear that whatever I was, it was less than a boy. I saw that my brothers, who were five, 10, and 15 years older than I, could do all of our laboratory play in the outside world. In Cub Scouts, they raced model cars and built and set off rockets. In shop class, they used tools big and powerful enough to be mounted on the wall or suspended from the ceiling. When we watched Carl Sagan and Mr. Spock and Doctor Who and the Professor, we never even commented on Nurse Chapel or Mary Ann in the background. I retreated further into my father's laboratory as the place where I could most freely explore the mechanical world. And that's, that's sort of a, a, a nice quote that I think sums up um, one of the main themes of the book. Mm. Mm -hmm. nice. Good. Sounds great. And I, I, the link I put there, actually, instead of I don't know if you've been to Powell's Bookstore in Portland, Oregon. It's an awesome bookstore, and their website, they have an essay that she, that she wrote. And so instead of a link directly to the book, I put a link to her essay. Nice. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty. It's good. Well, my pick has to do with the weather, which is a theme here on TWIV. And it's a Ars Technica article. And if you've ever got NWS forecasts you know, on your phone or on your computer, you know they're all in capitals as if they're yelling at you, but that's because they were <laughs> sent by ancient technology teletype machines, which can't distinguish between upper and lower case. And now the National Weather Service is, as of May 11th, no more capitals. <laughs> wow. So they've upgraded their supercomputing core and gotten rid of the teletypes, so now the weather will be sent out in... Um, in regular upper and lower case. So, you know, if you go on your weather app and then you get an alert of some kind, when you click on the alert, it's always in caps. No more, not after May 11th. So I, I don't know. I don't know about this because those, you know, <laughs> it's, I'm going to not have, you know, I'm going to not take it as seriously. Well, they do <laughs> say, they do say that all caps will not be verboten. Going all caps will be allowed in order to emphasize threats, yeah. and international bulletins will continue to be sent all caps to comply with regulations outside the United States. Good. That's comforting. I like so, it. You know, and there's a 30-day 30, 30 transition period. so mm -hmm. and It probably won't work or something, but you know, so they can uh, – it'll seem like they're not yelling at you, but if it's all caps rich, you know, it means it's important. The last line is hilarious. The most recent call to mixed case action came from a 2010 <laughs> comment request sent to all weather forecast subscribers and customers. It was written entirely in uppercase. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, online when you write in uppercase, people think you're yelling at them, of course. But the, yeah. weather, the weather service has been doing that for years. All right, we have two listener picks. First is from Basel, who writes, Dear Twiv Ohms, following up on the unit's Used to report temperature during weather updates, I'd like to participate with the pick of the week, the Gimli Glider and the Mars Climate Orbiter, two major accidents due to measuring unit communication. I'll leave the details for you to explore oh, wow. in the following links. Yeah. 
the, the Gimli glider one is amazing. Yeah, so these yeah. Uh, you, sh- you should read these are these are good. We don't yeah. want to go into them here. Thank you for that. Also, in the spirit of repeated plant virology requests, I suggest exploring the idea of inviting Adib Rohani and Maher Al Rawani. These guys, especially Maher, are the plant virus hunters using next generation sequencing. Here's a link to their facility and a list of their PubMed publications. So we'll explore that and why not? And one from Ken. Here's a very nice comic book uh, about vaccination. Uh, Vaccines work. Here are the facts. And, you know, you can't get enough of these. It's a really good comic book. It Uh, it is very good. Graphic novel type thing. Yes. It's excellent. Um. By the way, it isn't that easy to find the TWIV email address at microbe.tv slash TWIV. All right, look, microbe. <laughs> I think you've made it easier since he wrote that email because I had that complaint at first also. every uh, Well, actually, it's not on the, the, the body of the page, but it's in every post, right? So if you look at TWIV385, at the bottom it says, send your virology questions. Yeah, I did add that thing. You're right. To twiv it's up at, at my, the top, I right. did write it. I added Questions it or comments right at the top. Yeah, I yeah. didn't have that before. But it is in every post. It's, in fact, the last line of every post. Send your virology. Yeah. Twiv at microbe TV. So there are okay. at least two places on each page. Right? Yeah, I guess the top is the important one. Yeah, yeah this is, you know, making a new website is an evolutionary thing, you know. <laughs> and I'm still finding things that don't work. Yeah, and and so I, yeah I, think, I think a lot of us look for contact us. And yeah. Up yep, yep. there in the blue bar, it's not. So that's all right. Yep, yeah. here you go. Thanks for that. And uh, this is Twift 386. You can find it at iTunes, iTunes, microbe.tv slash Twift. And we are now on Google Play Music, which is a, you know, Google Play Music has been around for a while, but they decided to now include podcasts. So all of the Microbe TV podcasts can be found there if you prefer Google. There you go. You got it all. Of course, other places as well, Stitcher and, and any of these many podcatchers that you can get for our iPhone, iOS, or Android devices. And as we just said, send your questions and comments to twiv at microbe.tv. Welkin Johnson is at Boston College Department of Biology. Thank you, Welkin. Thank you. Do you have a lot of diverse uh, interests in, the, in a biology department there? Uh. Yeah, yeah. You're not the only, you're probably the only virologist, is that right? Uh, there's a couple other virologists, but we cover the range from, I mean, we have some pure computational labs, RNA labs, mm. uh, one Xenopus lab, one zebrafish lab. So it's, sometimes it's tough to get us to go to each other's seminars and things <laughs> like that because we speak very different languages. Yes, but it, I like it because in, in my travels when I visit a bio department, I always like that because you talk to a lot of different people, but I can understand. I, I get the hint. Please what do you feel free mean? to visit any No, no, it's not a hint at all. It's not a hint. I just like... No, we'd love to have Because I'm in a micro and immuno department, and you know, yeah. I, I like micro and immuno, but I go out and I, I... Let's see, where did I go? I met a guy who worked on cacti and you know someone who works on amoeba of the soil, and it's really interesting to talk to them. Now, maybe on a daily basis, it's harder because you can't go to their seminars easily but and anyway, i i like the idea of a biology department it's pretty cool ted deal is at the university of massachusetts in worcester thank you ted thank you for having me good luck there in the uh lubin lab thank you thank you kathy spindler is at the university of michigan in ann arbor thank you kathy thanks this is a lot of fun and rich condit is an emeritus professor at the university of florida in gainesville thank you rich enough. Always a good time. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> <laughs>